Welcome, uh, agroecology class. I'm really happy today to introduce to you my colleague, uh, Professor Dominique Brassard. Uh, Dr. Brassard is a professor and chair in the Life Science Communication Department here at UW-Madison. She, she's an expert on science communication and the public opinion that's associated with uh, controversial topics like genetically modified organisms, which is uh, what we're gonna talk about today. And she runs a research group on science, media, and the public. And I think what I'm learning about as I learn more about GMOs is that there's as much perception as there is science behind the, the, you know, this particular topic. Uh, Dr. Broussard uh, was a co-author on a 2016 National Academies report on genetically mo modified organisms that kind of synthesized the state of knowledge uh, in the field. And so I thought there could be no better person to help us kind of wrap our mind around this uh, complex topic uh, and than, than uh, Dominique. So I would just want to start with the seemingly simple question of why is this GMO, genetically modified organism, why is this GMO debate so polarizing when it comes to food? Yeah, so you said two important, you know, like you used two important terms here. You said GMOs already, that sounds very obscure, and food. And mm -hmm. so the first item in the GMO part is that we tend to simplify it and equate it with like, you know, one dimension that's important to us. So for some people, you know, GMO means farmer's livelihood. For other people, GMO means new technology. For other people, GMO means modern agriculture and so on. And anything that, you know, that have those type of dimensions that will appeal to and resonate with something we have in our mind tend to be controversial. You add to that the food component. And for us, you know, anything we put in our mouth and so on and it's related to our health can generate fears. So we have the recipe here with this issue for, you know, like people actually arguing about it. Mm. There was a, a, a Pew uh, Trust um, um, poll in 2016 where they asked people about their attitudes or their perceptions of genetically modified foods. And 40%, uh, um, approximately 40% of people thought that genetically modified foods were bad for their health. And the report that you were a co-author on suggested that there's no really good evidence that that's actually uh, the case with the lifespan of the the you know of these products that have been on the market uh, of course so how, how, you know how is it that we can you know kind of bring science and people together to kind of understand the, the you know the you know what gmos really are about yeah that's a great question so uh, unfortunately or let's say just the reality uh, is that human beings you know we are animals and what's happening in our mind is extremely important. And we cannot make sense of the world around us that's very complicated just by using what we call systematic thinking. Is that rationally think about things. So like, what is the science? What does science mm -hmm. tell us? We don't do that. What we do is we use mental shortcuts that actually help us make sense of the world around us. And as far as like the, the food related, you know, uh, potential uh, risk, unfortunately, there's been a lot of discussion in the press and so on uh, about the studies that have been retracted. There mm -hmm. was one that's been famously saying that, you know, that uh, consuming GMOs uh, would, uh, uh, you know, uh, produced tumors in rats. Right. They bunkered since then. It was like a rate, a, a, a rats, you know, that already were prone to have these kind of tumors and so on. However, once a study is published, you know, it stays in the realm of the internet. And one of the studies mm. that it showed that this study is coming in again and again in discussions about mm. uh, why you, we shouldn't eat GMOs. Mm. Add to that the fact that most Americans do not know really well the scientific process. And I blame K-12 education, unfortunately. Mm. They mm. cannot cover everything. So we ask people if they knew what a retracted study was. Mm. People do not know what a retracted study was. People do not know what peer review means. So the fact that wow. the scientific study is saying one thing and a retracted scientific study said another one, in people's mind, both of those things are science. So it's not that they don't trust science. It's just that they feel that there's all that, you know, like uh, evidence that's uh, contradicting each other. Huh. And people will find the science 
that actually, you know, uh, goes with their beliefs. So let's say, um, let's say, hypothetical here, that I'm wary of new technology, that I think new technology is actually something that is going too fast, right? And so already I have that preconceived notion that I have that it's risky. I'm going to pay more attention to that one study that mm. confirmed my belief than to the, all the other studies that actually disconfirm my belief. Huh. We call that in psychology motivated reasoning. The <laughs> fact that we're going to find the science that confirms our beliefs. Uh -huh. the, is that the same as the confirmation bias? Exactly. Also? Okay. So confirmation bias is part is one aspect of that motivated reasoning uh, uh -huh. that because you could also have this confirmation and so on. So dif there's different ways where our values and whatever we have mm -hmm. in our mind are use our shortcuts. It could be our political ideology, right? We we can we're gonna believe people that have the same political beliefs than us more than the other side. It could be our environmental beliefs, it could uh -huh. be our religious beliefs, and so on. So that, that raises the question of if, if, we're, if we're aware that these biases happen, that we use these shortcuts, these crutches in a, in a situation where we might, have, might, might not have complete information, how do, we, how do we kind of break ourselves outside of that? How do we step back and try to analyze a situation more objectively? Or is that, is that do we just need to abandon that and accept that we're going to have certain biases? No, I think, uh, first of all, yes, we need to acknowledge that we all will always have some biases. And that's just the, the human nature, right? Mm -hmm. True objectivity does not exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, we wish it was, but, but what we can do is like you're doing, Claudio, yeah. and uh, the students in the class, we can actually question ourselves and actually ask where we're coming from before hitting that share button on Facebook. Say, hey, why am I sharing that? Is it because... <laughs> It really makes me, oh, yes, I agree with that. Oh, like, let's just step back. Let's take three seconds to actually question, you know, why we feel this that way about certain things. And as a matter of fact, there's something that we call cognitive literacy. Is uh -huh. that idea that we are literate, we are educated about the way our mind works. We have media literacy. We have... Mm -hmm science literacy, but we have also something that's called cognitive literacy, that idea that we are aware of why we may reach a conclusion about mm. topics such as GMOs. Mm. And there's research that shows that if you work with middle schoolers, so, you know, way younger than the students in the class, they, they, they actually can become much more accustomed of questioning their belief and seeing why they think a certain way. So certainly, I think I would encourage all of us to actually think, why am I thinking that way. Why am I against GMOs? Why mm -hmm. am I against, or why am I, why am I pro GMOs, by the way? It's the same. Mm -hmm. Because as new, any technology is concerned, you know, it's not that they, they're like perfect. And GMOs are any other technology. They need to actually be deployed within a system that ensures that we are safe and so mm -hmm. on. So it's not that, you know, like they are without risk. Mm -hmm. They are, obviously they have benefits. Mm -hmm. And they have some risks. That's why we have, you know, different ways of like planting them, you know, with actually containment around mm -hmm. and so on. So, mm -hmm. so that's the idea is that we need to actually be conscious about why, you know, we are reaching a conclusion. And that's why we call cognitive literacy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. As you were saying that, it just made me think of a technology like the car, you know, in the wrong context, that could be a very dangerous technology, you know, they could... You know, so we have to create uh, structures that allow us to function with it, you know, in a safe uh, way and so that we can derive those benefits that, you know, obviously uh, transportation can, can bring us. Um, so I had behind... the card, Claudio, because I use that example all the time. Oh, is that right? And I said, imagine a little alien watching the, 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 the earth, right? And imagine that in their universe, there's no car. And they're like, oh my God, look at that. They're like driving all that stuff around. And, and if you didn't have any traffic laws, if we didn't have like, you know, lights, seat belts, driving licenses and so on, imagine the chaos that you would be on earth. <laughs> Just mayhem. Um, so uh, I have behind me, I don't know which way it goes here. I have behind me uh, some tomatoes uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that I like tomatoes. Uh, and the other one is that uh, maybe a lot of people don't know this, but tomatoes actually were one of the first 
but what were the first genetically modified uh, crops that were actually commercial, commercially available on the market. A lot of people think that uh, we don't eat genetically modified uh, organisms, but you know, in fact, we have been for, for a long time. What would you say some of the most common misconceptions are about genetically modified uh, organisms? You know, it's a, it goes back to the point that, you know, uh, most Americans have very vague notions of genetics. Mm. And, and uh, you know, you were talking about a pupil on attitudes toward GMOs. There was a National Science Foundation uh, a poll that was done a while back and that's repeated every two years. And they, one of the true false questions they were asking is, GMO tomatoes contain genes and regular, no, contain DNA and the regular tomatoes do not. <laughs> So you're laughing because you know what I'm <laughs> talking about. But anybody that has no idea what we're talking about, you know, they're like, ooh, this, that sounds dangerous. Uh, dangerous. So I think that one misconception uh, that people have is this notion of gene and where they come from and how we share. At the end of the day, we all start us, right? Like our atoms come from like the first Big Bang or, yeah. or whatever. But, you know, this is a very scientific way to look at life. Mm. And we shouldn't think that everyone has a same conception of life. There's a very strong, you know, um, uh, belief in God in the United States, and it's something that we need to actually think about. And a lot of people do not like the idea that we mess up with nature. Mm -hmm. And GMOs may be doing that. So it goes back to that idea. So what is nature? So for me, what's mm -hmm. nature may be very different from people that have very strong religious beliefs. So I think we shouldn't think in terms of misconceptions. Mm, I think we right. should think in terms of where are people coming from and that their conception of life, of reality is not ours. Good point. So it's not, because if we say misconception, make it sound our conception is the right one and their conception is the wrong one. Well, that's not the way we should think in terms of perception of risk and so on. Any concern is a right concern. There's no right and wrong concern. It's our job to actually listen and try to understand where people are coming from. So I would argue, and I'm, I would wonder what your students think, if the term misconception is the right one. That's a great, that's a great way to say it. We, mis, we have a misconception about misconceptions, I think is <laughs> the, the right way to, to say it. Well, thank you. I think that's actually a very valuable way of framing it. Um, I have a point that I want to share with your students. It's yes. like another one that actually at communication we talk about when I say misconception is the wrong way to see it, yeah. is that idea that they need to know and that, that uh, the same information can be understood mm. and processed very differently by two different people depending on who, that, who tells them that information. Uh -huh. Let's say I'm here in the room. And hopefully students, you believe what I say because Claudia was nice enough to introduce me and make it very authoritative and so on. But imagine if you meet me, you know, at the bus stop and, uh, and I'm like there with my French accent saying whatever, you know, say, what is she talking about? I mean, why is she telling me about GMO? So the idea is that the content of the message to some extent is less important than the messenger. So mm -hmm. if I'm trusting the messenger, I'm going to actually process the message one way. If I don't trust the messenger, I'm going to completely discard it. To come back to the point is maybe scientists are not the one in communities that actually do not believe that GMOs are safe to eat. Maybe they're not the one who should be talking about it. Mm. Should be some trusted opinion leader in the community. It could be, mm. you know, uh, some work we did on GMOs in the Philippines, for example, where we were working with priests because it was important for the livelihood of farmers to be able to grow those crops. And they actually help us actually having the community listen to us. So very important to think in terms of who's saying what, and that's, that's very important in risk perceptions. That's a very great point. Actually, you reminded me of the, the other question that I had, which, which is how do these attitudes uh, about genetically modified uh, crops vary across the, the planet? Um, you know, in the U.S., we have very different ideas on, you know, whether they should be part of our food system compared to Europe, for example. Yeah. So that's an excellent point. And it goes back to, 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 to the idea that when you think of risk, we, we talk about now, and this is a relatively young field, risk communication, we talk about risk in context. 
So risk is going to depend on the social, the cultural, the political, the institutional context in which it's deployed. So you, even United States, if you think about agricultural states where you know they use uh, uh, this technology already versus other states where it's much more like organic farming and so on, where food, relationship to food is different and so on, we have a very different perception of risk or perception of benefits. So what's tricky about technology is like there's no magic bullet or there's no one size fits all or how people feel about it. France, for example, extremely attached to the notion of we call terroir, that idea that, you know, a tiny region of France has, you know, their, 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 um, their cheese, their, their, their charcuterie, their wine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it will be very different as far as the technology is concerned than other parts of the world. You put on top of that what I was calling the political institutional system is the way risk is regulated. Mm. So in, in, in United States, we have a market-driven society where, you know, like uh, for GMOs and other food, you know, they are assumed safe if the counterpart is safe, mm-hmm. right? So like say you're genetic engineered corn, you already have some uh, normal corn, so they're regulated that way. Versus in Europe is a precautionary principle. So unless, until something is not declared, uh, not risky, is not going to be put in the market. So it's very mm-hmm. more precaution. And this colors how people feel about technology, including GMOs. So we have to remember that the, the laws and the culture that surround technology is going to also impact how people feel about them. Wow, that, that's a really great point. So highly heterogeneous around the world, given the context that people, that people are in, the institutional context, the cultural context, uh, and so on. You know, I was working on GMOs in Africa for a while and the local organization were getting very irritated because they really wanted to actually try to find, you know, crops in the local labs, working with uh, different collaborations that were answering the local need and you know like potentially use uh, genetic engineering with staple crops in that country to answer needs such as you know like drought and so on and you had ngos from outside like you know united Mm -hmm. states france germany that were coming and try to you know like uh, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, push them in one direction or the other on the other side, the pro side, you had big American corporations such as Monsanto and so on that were doing the pro thing. So it's an interesting, when you think about it at the international level, think about all those forces that come to compete to kind of like, you know, like uh, impact, you know, the potential attitudes, beliefs, and even usage of the technology at the local level. And mm-hmm. it's not only the anti-GMO, it's also the very pro-GMO. Yeah. So it's, a, it's we have to remember that they're very complicated forces at play. Yeah, what are the motivations for why these products are being uh, advertised as beneficial, really? What's, exactly. what's underneath it? Yeah, that's yeah. great. Anything else that uh, we should know in this particular arena that we haven't covered uh, so far? Yeah, since we're talking about the GMOs, but also, you know, communication in general, yeah. I want to remind the students that, you know, when I was talking about those mental shortcuts we use to reach our decision, we need to remember that media coverage is an important one. Uh-huh. And, and very often, you know, we see images and headlines and we don't really, you know, uh, unless it's in a, let's say, some context where we don't trust at all who says that, we need to remember that we also tend to process that very quickly and reach mm. conclusions very quickly. So uh, that whole idea of, you know, reaching conclusions based on images and easy things to process is something that you need to be wary about. And mm-hmm. so that's the notion of media literacy is very important too. Mm-hmm. So maybe the a strategy there is just to be aware that we are making these decisions and coming to a conclusion, you know, maybe without having that thinking, you know, that should, should anticipate it a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's the most important thing we need to keep in mind. We can all together make th- this world a better place. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dominique. This has been great. I've learned a ton.